Hi, I'm Steve Rubin, and I'm honored to be today's Tech Talk travel guest. We're recording from New York City, one of the world's number one travel destinations. episode of techtalk.travel coming to you from New York City and today I have as our special guest Stephen Rubin. Stephen is from Tri Hospitality and also adjunct professor at NYU. Stephen, great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It's an honor to be here and oh, thank you for coming to New York City to, to join me. My pleasure. Absolute pleasure. I love this city. It's a great place. The last time I was here was also in winter, 2008, and it was freezing. I couldn't deal with it. <laughs> it's not too warm today either. It's no. Been but a, it's, been, it's been a great winter though. Yeah. Yeah. The sun is shining. It's blue sky. So that's a nice thing. Yep. Good. Stephen, let's get right into it. Sure. Um, I'd, I'd like to maybe start by a little bit of a background on you. What was your motivation to get into the hospitality industry? What was it that um, kind of drove you to want to really focus on this area? Mm -hmm. And um, how have you, uh, in your career, um, felt that it's been a, a, well, has it been what, it, what you expected it to be? Yeah, so um, my entry into the industry, I'm really not sure where it started. Um, my earliest memory is at the age of about 12, having a strong desire to get into travel space. Mm -hmm. um, I never really traveled much as a kid, um, really didn't get out of the time zone from the Pacific Northwest to Hawaii until I was 16. But that experience of being at a resort hotel, um, that feeling, I'll never forget. And that just, um, that really sealed it for me. It was like, I wanna do this. Mm -hmm. So I've always wanted to be in the travel industry, went to school for this, I actually went to Washington State University, it just made sense being in Seattle, going somewhere close, an amazing program, um, and I've been in New York City in the travel industry ever since. Okay. Um, how does it, you know, it's, it's an interesting industry. Um, I joined it, I was, you know, a traditional person, probably like yourself too, when you join the industry, it's what do you want to be? Mm -hmm. I want to be a general manager. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, it's, it's that hospitality side that's always been there for me. Mm. It is at the core for me. Um, but the, I always, I was always that person, that manager that tried to challenge conventional wisdom. It's like, Oh, why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? What if we were to flip this upside down and look at it in a different way? Mm. And for me, technology does that. And so I quickly adopted this passion for travel innovation and travel technology. Um, so that's where, where it's been, that's where I am kind of now, and obviously that's where I want to stay. Yeah, yeah, cool, that's good. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean when you uh, have that experience as a kid. Um, those, those, often those family trips away, they stick with you, don't they? And so many people in our industry have been inspired to work in this industry because of, of those types of experiences, which I think is fantastic. It comes back to, as we were saying before, just before we started the interview, mm -hmm. the, the art of hospitality and the influence that a true hospitality person can have on, on people during yeah. their, um, I guess, youth or informative years mm -hmm. is, is, is very, um, it can't be underestimated. Yeah, I completely sense. agree. And, you know, I always, you know, I, I knew I was never going to become a scientist. Yeah. I was never going to be a doctor and save lives. Yeah. But I always knew part of me wanted to make a difference. And even if the difference was just in a single individual's life yeah. um, through hospitality, and it does, it makes, you know, mm. you see people's faces after they have a great stay and a great experience and it just, it changes everything. Mm, mm, yeah, it does. All right, good stuff. Moving on, um, in terms of your personal booking habits, I'd like to understand how a person with your experience, your background, how do you book your trips when you have, for example, a, a business trip where you're booking for yourself or you're going with your family on a holiday somewhere? What, what are some of the things and the criteria do you look for? Are you a brand loyal person mm -hmm. when you book? Are you more of a, I shop for the best rates that I can get? Or are you an experienced type of booker? How do you rate your, um, your booking profile, if you like? Yeah. And do you use kayak? Are you a kayak man in terms of meta searching and that type of thing? Um, so it's tough. It's tough being someone in the industry and who focuses a lot on online experience and then also focuses a lot on hospitality service to travel. Um, 
I will say that I am a fan of Airbnb. Yep. Um, for me personally, when I stayed, I was just at a branded hotel last weekend and it fell completely short. I noticed everything. Mm. You know, it's, oh, this towel's old. This towel's got some grime on it because you know what, they're using an industrial um, cleaner and they didn't take the time. Uh, you short sheeted me. You know, all the little things. Um, you didn't smile. You didn't make eye contact within 10 feet or whatever it is. Um, so for me, I have no expectations on Airbnb. So no matter what goes wrong, I'm like, ah, it's just Airbnb. Mm. Um, but I also, I also really, and I always have, I've been somebody that likes the experiential side of it. So um, even before Airbnb, I wanted to make sure that I stayed somewhere where I could feel the culture of the environment that I was in. Go to the grocery store, shop. Maybe if I'm staying at somebody's apartment, be able to come back and cook the local food. Um, walk around, hear the local language, just people watch. So I think uh, experiential is huge in the industry. I think it's one of the biggest things um, that is trending right now. Um, so I would say for me on a travel side, um, I'm, I'm accommodations agnostic. Yeah. And I think that that's also a term that we're gonna hear a lot more about. Yeah. Depending on what I'm traveling, the purpose um, which is typically driven by the experience I want to have is where I'm going to stay. Mm. So if it's a business trip and I'm more looking to, I'm going to have, um, I'm going to be at the hotel a lot. I'm looking for a nice boutique hotel. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking for something that provides that, whether that's, uh, something like a citizen M where it might be a smaller accommodation, but I don't want to be in my room. I want to be downstairs. I want to have space to work. Um, I don't want to feel trapped or it's a Kimpton hotel or um, one of the commune hotels. Um, I want to feel the local flair and I don't typically stay at brands because mm -hmm. I feel like brands, you know what you're going to get and I don't want that. I want something a little different. I yeah. want to be able to tell a story. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I, find, I think the brands also recognize that themselves. They're really trying to offer that type of experience mm -hmm. for their brand loyal customer. Um, like for example, Marriott with Moxie with that brand. Oh, um, but you mentioned earlier with Airbnb, I, I agree with you, I'm an Airbnb fan as well. I like to experience that quirkiness about mm -hmm. it and you really don't know what you're gonna get every time. Yeah. Some experiences are great, others are a bit, mm, that was a bit dodgy, but it comes with the territory. But I've noticed as well with Airbnb, there's been a very subtle shift in their direction as well and their approach yes. to how they're going into I guess you could say the corporate side of the business because they recognize there's a huge opportunity on the corporate side and I think they're trying to somehow balance out the direction that they're going to go in. They've, for example, opened up a test property of their own in Florida yes. that they're running for uh, as a pilot for their own bricks and mortar type of building. So what, just quickly on the Airbnb piece yeah, again, yeah. what's your take on that? Because as a New Yorker, as an American, um, as someone that is a fan of the brand, what's your expectation of them in the next three to five years? It'll be interesting. Um, I think that, you know, separating Airbnb from home sharing, I see a lot of all that in home sharing and I, I believe strongly that there will be um, a couple of brands like, like in the hotel industry, you have your big brands and there's going to be a management company that manages different apartments and houses and they have standards, they have a brand standard, they have a brand voice, they have all that and they're managing thousands of rooms around the world. Airbnb can't be that. Mm. Airbnb needs to figure out what they want to be. And right now I think that they're trying to do too much with the, the spot in Florida, um, I think the business trying to attract business travelers is a smart play by them because it's a demographic and a, a purpose for travel that they really haven't hit mm -hmm. and it's obviously huge, mm -hmm. multi-trillion dollar industry. Um, and I think that they're, I know that they're also going to now start listing, uh, or they already have boutique hotels and they're trying to do that. The problem is, is where does this all, how does it fall under what they're doing? What is Airbnb and what does Airbnb want to be? So if they're just going to be a listing site, um, then that's great. Then they should be listing all these properties. They're, the challenge is, is they also want to focus on experience and um, I think that's great. I think that their experiential site is fantastic. I think it makes sense. But how do they keep the customer forward side of it and keep the customer centric side and say, hey, 
we want to do right by our guests and our customers. And that's going to be their challenge because if they do too much, they're not, they're going to lose. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be, you know, mm -hmm. it'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily hospitality people. So can they run yeah. <laughs> a hotel or building that is servicing guests? Yeah. yeah. Well, if not, I'm sure they can, they can bring people in, all the good people. They've got the budget for it. They definitely, definitely have the budget for it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, coming to the hotelier a little bit now, I'd like yeah. to touch a little bit on, on uh, the hotelier from your perspective. We, we spoke a little bit before offline when we, when we met about the challenges that modern day hoteliers face with, with technology and um, how they can best position themselves so that they can be in the right space when it comes to competing with the likes of Airbnb, also with the big brands from within an environment or a city like New York. Um, let's, let's first touch on the technology piece. Where do you feel that independent hotel operators or smaller groups are missing the mark when it comes to technology? They, they understand that they need it, but they seem to be yeah. missing a point, when, in, in, I guess, in how best to apply it or which, which is the best technology for them. What would be your advice to, to an independent operator who maybe needs to make some decisions around choosing technology? Uh, there's, there's no one piece of advice. Um, actually, I'd say my one piece of advice for a small hotel operator, boutique hotel company, um, is to find strong outside counsel. Mm -hmm. um, you're not gonna know everything. And the challenge that, one of the biggest challenges hotel companies have with technology is their key person that they know or that they're meeting with is the salesperson. Mm -hmm. And in technology, as those of us who are, have been in the technology space um, or you know, are, are passionate about it know, the salesperson is selling something that doesn't exist. And they're selling a roadmap and they're selling it as if it's already launched. So hoteliers are, um, they've been fooled. And that's, that's a major pitfall that a lot of hoteliers are falling into. So my one biggest piece of advice is find some outside counsel that really strongly has a deep understanding of technology and what the technology can do, what type of integrations they have, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't get that outside counsel, you are putting yourself in a position where you might adapt something or pay for something that is two to three years away Mm -hmm. from hitting it, let alone a year. Mm -hmm. Really, technology should only be a couple months away from hitting it um, on the sales versus adaptability standpoint, mm -hmm. but it's not always there. Yeah. Yeah. So you gotta find somebody you trust. So when you say outside counsel, you mean specifically consultants, industry consultants? I don't think or... it has to be an industry consultant. Okay. Um, a lot of companies can't pay for an industry consultant. Yeah, right. um, it can just be your friend who works in technology for a bigger brand right. or for another, you know, it's, and it doesn't just have to be a single outside yeah. counsel. If you can make it somebody who is a consultant or especially if they worked, um, have worked previously for some of the technology that you, your main yep. pieces, your RMS, your CRS, your PMS, um, then that definitely would be worth it. Yeah. But it could be a group. It could be an advisory group. And really, I mean, Andre, what is the one thing you love to do when you travel? Stay at nice hotels. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves staying in nice hotels. A hotel company has nice hotels or hotel rooms. They have a product that is there. Just fly somebody out. I mean, it could be a group of five people that you trust. Give them an experience in your hotel, wind them dining for a weekend, and ask them the right questions. Yeah. It's not a huge budget line item. You can yeah. get creative with it. Exactly, exactly. The reason why I ask if, if, if you specifically mean consultants is because I think historically or traditionally, um, especially in my side of the world and the experience that I've had, um, consultants can be a little biased in terms yes. of what they're presenting to the owner. And I think uh, the owners need to be very aware of what they're being presented with. And I'll give you a good example. I was talking mm -hmm. with... Um, a gentleman, I won't name, but a gentleman who's very successful in, in his area of, of software in our industry. And he was telling me a story of how there was a glamping um, in, or a glamping company in California that had 15 individual uh, uh, sites. Yeah. And they hired a consultant to, to determine which was the best PMS for them. And can you guess which PMS they, they ended up buying based on the consultant's opinion? Micros. Micros, yep. 
opera. Yeah. For, for a 15 site glamping, they're spending something like thousands and yeah. thousands of dollars. And that's just totally absurd. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they just weren't given the right advice. And they took that advice probably yeah. because it was from someone that they felt was an industry. They're specialist. also motivated financially. Absolutely. So Absolutely. As I had my own consulting company. I've yeah. been in and out of it. Yeah. Um, you know, during the beginning, I had a ton of people contact me from the technology saying, hey, sign me up for this. Mm -hmm. if, for each hotel you sign me up for, you can get this. Right. And I refused. Yeah, good. Probably is why the consulting company hasn't done as well as other ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but it's, but it's, not, it's not fair. No, I agree with you. And I'm, I, it's good that you did refuse yeah. because it's important that we stay true to the industry. Um, and this is where I think we need to be very neutral and unbiased. When we when we present ourselves in that sense mm -hmm. as consultants or as a consultant, I think they need to be they need to hold themselves to a standard. So I think it's very interesting. Yeah, and I think that there's there's no one technology that fits all. Yeah. Um, and there's and and there's pros and cons to every technology that's out there. Mm. Um, and you need to weigh that. You need to decide. Hey, if this is the revenue management, I'm looking for a revenue management system. Well, okay. Well, what's my CR? What's my CRS and PMS? What's the integration level? Mm. What can they do? Mm. How will it complement that? So, what are my what are my business philosophies? Do I believe in full pattern length of stay? Do I believe in day pricing? Um, do am I a group hotel versus a non versus a transient hotel? Mm. Which is the best system for my product? Mm. Um, Who is going to be the best partner? Mm. And that's the other side of it too. I, I'm a big person with partnerships mm -hmm. and open communication and dialogue, yeah. and um, you got to make sure that you feel comfortable with the technology vendor you're adapting. Yeah. Your business is aligned with them, and there's a long future for it because it is a long partnership with these technology companies. And it should be, mm -hmm. but it got, has to be give and take. Mm -hmm. Yes, transparency is key. Transparency is huge on both sides. Absolutely. Okay, so let's move a little bit to um, China and the outbound tourists of China. I was at Hedna last week and they had some um, Chinese folks from uh, Meituan and they, they were talking about the evolution of the Chinese traveler and also a little bit about WeChat. How, uh, in your mind, do, do the American or is the American market seeing the opportunity with the Chinese traveler? And the reason why I ask is because of all of the destinations of the outbound travelers, America is in the top five. So yes. there's, there's a large number of, of Chinese travelers coming to America. They've got more money to spend. They're more independent. They're not following the flag anymore on those tour mm -hmm. buses. They're experiencing their own experiences. They're looking they for more authentic experiences. So how do you feel is the American hotel market preparing themselves for that wave? And are they seeing, are they really seeing the opportunity that is lying there waiting to be taken? It's, it's a difficult one um, because it's so remote, it's so far away. And um, the big brands, I think, are doing an incredible job, but they have the money to do it. Mm -hmm. They can have a, a sales team there. Um, they can risk, you know, doing something with WeChat. Um, they, you know, they just, they can get locals. They can do study. They can do focus groups. Um, the challenge is with the boutique companies. Mm -hmm. I can't, you know, if I'm working for a small boutique in New York City or um, in the U.S., even if I'm in destinations, um, the Northwest is a great example. I, I can't afford to put all those, you know, resources into it. So I think the the big thing is, and this is regardless of if it's um, in China or if it's South America and what's going on with, you know, Brazil used to be one of the bigger inbound for New York City and it's slowed down. But it's also a very cyclical thing. There's the economic challenges, there's the Olympics, the World Cup, there's a lot going on down there and it will start to come back. But then how does a hotel company start focusing on that market? So the first thing is, just, you know, this is hospitality. You got to understand the demographics, the culture, you have to be able to do that. And you can do all that research online. There's enough information out there. Everything, Andre, that you just mentioned about the Chinese travelers, you can read about that stuff. Of course, yeah. But you gotta take you gotta invest the time mm. into doing that. You know, I'm a big fan of hiring younger sales teams that focus on online research. Mm -hmm. They're on LinkedIn, they understand WeChat, they know all the latest things, and they're gonna embed themselves into that. 
If you're just focusing on the things that the low hanging fruit, if you will, and you're hiring a sales team or a marketing team, or even a revenue team, an operations team that is only embedded in traditional sales, traditional marketing, traditional demographics and markets, you're not going to be able to enter into and take advantage of all that travel. Mm. So, you know, I don't have a, a one answer mm. to how to capture it. I can just say that you really need to have somebody that focuses on it. They have to have goals around it and you have to make sure you're challenging them and putting them in the right places. Mm. If you're not going to play, you're not going to gain anything. Mm, true. So you have to sign up the C trips. You have to be on the WeChat. Mm. You have to look at Momundo. You have to look at, you know, um, hotels combined and you have to play mm. to win. Mm. If you're not going to buy the lotto ticket, the chances are you're never going to win the lotto. Mm -hmm. You can't sit around dreaming that you're going to win the lotto if you're not even playing. Mm -hmm. I think also a very important part, especially around WeChat, is ease of entry into the platform for a hotel. Yeah. You mentioned before the larger groups. Yes, in China, they have their own Chinese entity, so they can actually apply for a branding or a, or a position within the WeChat, WeChat platform very, very mm -hmm. easily. However, if you don't have that Chinese entity in country, you can't come in as from, for example, an outsider's perspective, yeah. if I'm an independent operator here in New York, I can't go to WeChat and say, I'd like to have my hotel on WeChat, please, can you help me? I'll say, no, you need to have a Chinese re representation company either doing it for you or have your own entity. And that, if, if, if someone can come along and make that entry point easy mm -hmm. and smooth, I think it'll help also, and also then deliver the, the, the message to the operators here, or anywhere really, um, the easy way on, it'll help a lot. Clear but, the but there are vendor partners that are out there uh -huh. that will help you do that. Okay. Um, here in America? In America, yeah. Awesome. Um, they're still very new, um, but they're, you know, we, I've been approached by some, um, with previous, you know, consulting jobs and regular positions, uh, full-time positions, but you got to have the company. You have to actually invest the time in yep. researching it and working on it. Yep. And even if it's not WeChat, you know, there's no reason why you can't do more things on LinkedIn mm -hmm. um, or, you know, translating your website correctly. Mm -hmm. Well, on the website as well, you can translate it correctly, but in well, order for to it to a, be, yeah. fit, it needs to be hosted in China as well. Mm -hmm. That's another thing a lot of hotel groups don't really understand outside of China. Yeah. Hosting in Hong Kong or Singapore is better, but it's not the same. Its speed is, is, is an issue, even when you move, as soon as you're out of mainland China, hosting of websites for the Chinese market becomes an issue. So, yeah. so in, at minimal, meet with your OTA partners. Mm. You know, if you want to capture the business the, and understand the booking trends, what is the booking window? Mm. I'm assuming it's a longer booking window. They're mm. traveling further. So at least you could do is if you're not meeting with the key, the key OTAs down there, um, you're not able to you know, find a way because you don't have the partnerships down there. You do have partnerships here. Mm -hmm. um, and you can figure out how to do it that way. Maybe it's, you know, you can do geo-targeted promotions. Um, you can work with your... Uh, existing partners and vendors, you just have to ask the right questions and continue to challenge them. Yeah. And you'll find something yeah. and it'll fit. Yeah. And then, it, you know, hopefully it trickles down and sooner or later it catches. Yeah. Also, the other thing as well, if a hotelier does capture the, the, the traveler, the Chinese traveler... Then you need to be able to service them. Exactly. And that's the other point that they also need to consider. They mustn't forget that when they're on property, what do you need to do to offer them the, or meet their expectations mm -hmm. in terms of even having a, a Chinese or a Mandarin speaking staff member that can help them with directions, offering a Chinese breakfast, Chinese content on the television, all of that is um, an important part that yeah. hotels mustn't neglect as well. But I also bet, yes, they shouldn't be neglecting it, but I think that they shouldn't be afraid of it. No. So if you don't have that, that's okay, but you can do something. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the challenges hotels have is they, if it's not 100%, they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's okay. But you also have to know that you're not doing everything you can. Um, but you try, you know, you got to at least try. Um, and then on the other side of it too, like you're saying, the, the increase in interest in, you know, outbound travel within the Chinese market is also the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And they're very focused on experiences mm -hmm. and they want to be embedded into the culture. So maybe you're not providing 
some of the Chinese breakfast, the translations, but you're providing a hospitable staff that's helping work, you know, helping curate an experience for them. Maybe it's like the moxie, like we were talking about the moxie earlier. Like that's one of the great things a lot of these um, boutique hotels are doing now. They're creating the environment for people to take pictures. And that's part of what, you know, what do these Chinese travelers want? And any traveler, they want to be able to come to a destination, snap photos, and share their experiences with their friends online. It's a social environment. Mm. It's all about that social experience and sharing that social experience. So how are you curating that? Mm. Are you giving them the opportunity to do that with either in-stay or outside of the hotel within the city? And that will go a long way. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point too, absolutely. Okay, one other question around um, technology and the future of, if you like. Um, and it's, every, it's kind of on everyone's lips that has association to technology in our industry, and that's blockchain. Um, there's still amongst our peers perhaps a little bit of a grey area in terms of what value can it really bring us and do we see that it can really be applied in our industry. Staunch advocates are saying absolutely, it's going to, it's going to change the way we do business, it's going to be a huge, it's going to have a huge impact. Yeah. Others are a little skeptical, they're wondering, you know, let's wait and see. What's your take on that and how do you see, um, based on your experience, how do you see the immediate future with blockchain, the adoption of blockchain? Do you, do you think that um, there's an opportunity for, or there should be an opportunity for the smaller independents to make sure that they're at the forefront so that they're not missing out on any potential advances in development of technology that could possibly impact them, especially when it comes to distribution on the OTA side? What's your take on it? You know, I think that the, the blockchain thing is fascinating. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see where it goes. Um, I think at the core of blockchain is the simple ledger mm -hmm. um, concept. And one of, the, one of the top five biggest challenges that hotels have right now is costs, and especially distribution costs. They are growing exponentially faster and have been over the past five, 10 years than hotels ADRs and revenue. So my thing has been with blockchain, my focus with blockchain is on how can I reduce my distribution expenses. That credit card fee line item is it's ridiculous. ridiculous. Yeah. Transaction fees mm. are huge for hotels. Mm. And what, two, three years ago, Expedia coming on and saying, hey, I'm gonna start passing my credit card fees to the hotels. And, and hoteliers were like, why is Expedia doing this? And they all said, okay. And then they did their budgets and their P&Ls and they're like, this is a couple hundred thousand dollars for small boutique hotels to million dollars worth of expenses that just got added on. How can we reduce those expenses and put that money somewhere else? Mm. And at the heart of blockchain, I mean, that's really what it is. It's mm. the general ledger. So if that can be the first step where blockchain can help hotels to reduce expenses, I think that's a huge win, and I'm a big fan of that. The other stuff, um, how are they going to challenge the OTAs? How are they going to challenge the CRSs? Uh, that's so far down the line, and it's a big F. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at, and I'm kind of a travel geek, so I actually read the, the uh, SEC filings that Expedia does. I mean, how much money are they spending on marketing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a couple billion? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's why they're able to make so many reservations. It's not about the technology behind the system, it's about their marketing dollars. Mm -hmm. And when you look at travel companies that are trying to go online, it's how do they you know, make, having enough money for the customer acquisition, I just don't see how blockchain's gonna help you know, a company do that. Mm -hmm. It's gotta, it, right now it just needs to be helping hotels reduce that transactional mm -hmm. cost, which is, really, you know, a challenge in the industry. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. So Steve, just talking about now in terms of guest experience and relating that back to the art of hospitality, what does that mean to you? And, and um, from, well, from your perspective, how does that um, apply to the industry? Yeah, I think it's, I think that the industry is at an interesting point with the guest experience. Um, so what does guest experience mean to me in the art of hospitality? I believe in the golden rule of service. And the golden rule of service to me, and I teach this at NYU, um, even though I'm teaching a revenue class, um, is 
anticipating a guest's needs before they know they need it. And I think that the industry's forgotten that. So what does that look like and how would you incorporate technology into it? And it's simple things. And I think that um, I, I, I'm so confused as why the hotel industry hasn't been able to master this yet. I'm flying in. You have my ETA. I was supposed to arrive at one o'clock. You know which flight I was on. Guess what? I show up at 11 p.m. I don't go and do your online check-in until 10 p.m. What's the assessment? I probably had a long day. My flight got delayed. I had to deal with airlines which provide absolutely no service. I've now landed in a city that I'm not familiar with and I'm starving. So why can't, uh, through technology and through um, a, a good CRM and through good data analytics, the next thing that happens when we get that check-in, that automated check-in online, would you like, last time you stayed with us, Mr. Rubin, we noticed you had a turkey sandwich. Can we put a turkey sandwich in your room? Or something like that. And provide that, because when I get to that hotel, I'm gonna be in a bad mood and would be hungry. So just, you know, in that, that hour time to get there, you know where I've you know, stayed with you before or within your brand before. You know what I've ordered before. Do something to help me out. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities to adapt technology and not be intimidated by the word algorithm to create work with the technology solutions and the vendors you're working with, whether it's that in-stay messaging, the pre-stay messaging, to create an algorithm that basically says what you want them to say. If somebody arrives X amount of hours past their arrival time or after X time, send this message. Mm -hmm. And I think that I know that we can figure it out sooner or later, but I'd like to see more of it in the industry. Yeah, yeah, good point. I think, um, again, you know, the, the larger chains recognize that and are trying yes. to, to do that. And I think they'll probably get there first because they have the, the greater capacity to be able mm -hmm. to test those things out. But I think also the independents need to, they need to focus on that too. It's very important. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and in terms of the independence piece, the technology providers perhaps could work with the independents a little more and assist them in trying to help them understand that point as well rather than just perhaps let them follow on from what the bigger chains are doing yeah or them the take chances take yeah. chances as a you know an independent hotel find the technology yeah. vendor yeah do what you need to do it yeah and you know I we were talking about earlier today too about the technology that's available now is so much better than it was two years ago mm, mm. so you can get you can get a chat functionality that has a bot behind it mm. Now work with the, that vendor to make sure the bot's saying what you want it to say when you want to say. Mm, yeah, exactly. It's not that hard, but you, if you're not challenging them and you're not asking them, hey, here's my business challenge. I need to provide more, better service to my guests that are arriving late. What can we do as a partnership to address this? Look, come up with the answers, but you got to challenge them, you got to ask the right question. Yes, yeah, totally. Absolutely. Good. And um, second last question, in terms of, you're, you're a teacher, obviously, you mm -hmm. teach at NYU. What's your take on the future generation of leaders in our industry and the students that you have in your class? Are, um, is, the future, is the industry in good hands? And um, yeah, talk to me about their passion and what drives them in terms, why did they come into this industry and what drives them moving forward in the future? And does technology yeah. have, a, have a, an influence in the way, the way they think? Our yeah, it's um, teaching is a blessing. Um, I love it. It's it's so much fun to go in and um, see. And I I teach both uh, undergrads and graduate students. Um, so it's fascinating when you when you look about the future of the industry. And on the undergrad level, it's you know kids in their teens and early twenties that have so much energy, so much passion about the industry, and they're very tech savvy. Um, and you know they challenge everything in the classroom. Um, and I, the way that I teach, and I have, um, I live by uh, Peter Drucker's model of culture eats strategy for breakfast. So I try to create a very open culture in, in the classroom and um, a lot of dialogue. On the graduate side, you've got people that were professionals in other industries and have so much experience in, again, I'm teaching a revenue strategy class. They don't know how to calculate REPAR. They don't even know what REPAR stands for. They don't know how to calculate ADR. They don't know about occupancy. Some of the basic things they have no idea about. They have all this great professional background. So I get to see 
the world, the travel world, and the business side of it through their eyes and the questions they're asking, amazing. Mm. So yeah, I think that combined between professionals that are already out there wanting to get into our industry, people who are coming up through the industry are very tech savvy, passionate about the industry. I'm excited about the industry. Um, I think that there's some amazing people in it. Um, the challenge is gonna be making sure that these younger people coming in and these um, even the business professionals are going in, that the cultures are set up right for their generations. You can't stick to the traditional model. Mm -hmm. You have to make, you have to give them projects that challenge them. Um, you can't give them a two year project. You know, it's, things gotta change. Otherwise they're gonna leave. And I wanna make sure that these kids um, and you know, younger professionals are working for hotel companies and not just the fun, flashy tech companies. Yeah. And that's gonna be the challenge, is hotel companies allowing them to do what they're passionate about yeah. and not stifling their creativity. Yeah. Do you think, um, as well, um, educational institutes are offering the right curriculum to students today that will bring them into the modern day hotel environment that they're facing? Um, because if you look yeah. at the curriculum at, at most institutions, they still follow what I studied at hotel school 20, well, I won't give my age away, but over 20 years ago, mm -hmm. a lot of it hasn't changed. It hasn't. So when will that, as a teacher, as someone that works yeah. in the institutes, what's, what's, what's your take on it? When do you think it's going, when, when's the shift going to happen? Because the, the students it's, are young, they're dynamic, they're, yeah, they're aware they of technology, they need something that's going to keep them interested. Um, I think that certain institutions that I've talked to are definitely doing it. Um, there's definitely a long way to go, but um, the challenge is, is how do you incorporate it all? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's so much that goes into uh, the travel industry from a business standpoint. From the, I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about hospitality on a technology-driven um, podcast and, you know, um, let's talk. And how do you make sure that somebody new coming in has worked the front desk and appreciates hospitality. Because at the core of what we do, it is hospitality. Technology needs to surround that and make it easier for everyone. Mm. Make it, make you be able to work faster, smarter, and not spend as much money from a business standpoint. But it also needs to help the traveler have a stronger experience, a better connection um, to the entire ecosystem. So it's so important, but at the heart, there's, but how do you teach hospitality? Yeah. And then if you're, you know, also how do you teach technology? So somebody coming through the hotel, you know, the hotel school, do they need to understand how to code? What part of technology do they need to know? How do they, you know, yeah. and there's just so much. Yeah. Um, I think that the big thing is, you know, I love that. I love how NYU has incorporated a lot of adjuncts like myself that can talk to them about the real world. Um, I wish I had more academic in my classroom and I have the ability to provide that. Um, but quite frankly, you know, I have a day job. <laughs> um, so it's hard to, to also incorporate all of that. Mm -hmm. um, part of it's on the students. I think that the key is providing the students with the right resources so that they can, mm -hmm. you know, explore it on their own time. Yeah. And um, what you guys are doing um, is fantastic because this is an opportunity for not just hoteliers um, and people within the travel industry to learn more about technology um, and the challenges that travel faces, but also for students. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, you know, I think the, the overarching thing, the number one thing is you have to provide them with a wide breadth of information and provide them with the resources so that they continue to um, get the research and the understanding outside yeah. of the classroom. Yeah, yeah, true, good point. Good, last question. Eric has asked me to ask you, where can I get, get the best red velvet muffins or cupcakes around here? Best red velvet cupcakes, I should have known Eric would ask this. <laughs> um, it's amazing that this is something that Eric likes since he's also <laughs> such a health freak. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm a traditionalist. I say Magnolia or Billy's. Okay. Yeah. Um, they have been in the city for the longest and Magnolia's has been around in the West Village. They still have lines out the door. Really? Wow. And Billy's was a spin-off of Magnolia 
uh, one of the bakers at Magnolia created his own company called Billy's. So, oh, okay, cool. You know, uh, if you want after this, we're in Soho, we can go. Oh yeah, to, let's do that. To that, or there's also uh, Molly's, there's Chloe's, I mean. Okay, cool. There's, there's plenty of places, but Good. yeah, okay. if you're here, if you're in New York, you gotta try okay. Magnolia or Billy's. I'm here, let's try it. <laughs> See, Ruben, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure and honor. And we'll see you again. Thank you. If you like this, everybody, make sure that you subscribe. Hit the bell button next to the subscribe button so you get the notifications. Tune in for the next show. Thanks for watching. It's bye for now.